This is the recording for your notes on natural selection. As we have been discussing, uh, Darwin proposed a mechanism for how organisms change over time. Remember, that's what we are looking at, how organisms change over time. And, and Darwin proposed a mechanism, and that mechanism is what we call natural selection. Now, to discuss natural selection, we need to understand the four basic premises that you need for this process to occur. And so we are gonna today we're gonna discuss each one of these in more detail. But here are kind of the four steps that you need for natural selection to occur. Number one and the most important because it's the foundation, you have to have natural variation, variation in your populations. So that's the basic element that there is variation, there are organisms are different and even for a one particular trait there can be more than one shape of that trait so think for example any of the traits that we studied in genetics and that those traits can have different alleles so variation exists in nature second is competition that's another important premise basically all the organisms are going to struggle for survival and because basically the environment produces more organisms that the environment can support. Basically we have more babies than uh, food or, or water or shelter available for all the babies. We need to eliminate humans out of the equation because humans we control our environment through the use of technology. So please for any discussion of evolution that we are going to do uh, in this unit of change over time, you need to leave humans out of the picture because we are not under the influence right now necessarily of natural selection for the most part because we control our environment and we develop technology, technology to help us deal with that. And we'll discuss this more in class. Now, since we have variation, since there is competition, because the resources are limited, of course that's going to mean that only a few individuals are going to survive. And the ones that survive are the ones that are best adapted, basically the ones that have the best set of traits that allow them to deal with the environment. And finally, because not all organisms survive, this is very important, in every generation not all organisms survive, the ones that survive are the ones that reproduce. So if a given, at a given time, if I have a variety of organisms here, not all of these organisms are going to survive. Let's say only these three here survive. So over time, if these are the ones that survive, these are the ones that are going to reproduce and provide the traits for the next generation. So if you look at here, it was the X, the vertical and the horizontal line that survived. So the next generation will be made out of those individuals. Oops, I'm so sorry. The next generation will be made out of those individuals and things like, for example, this trait here, a circle, did not make it to the next generation. So obviously this generation is going to be different than the original. That's the premise for organisms change over time. And we'll talk about that some more in class to provide you so with some more examples. So let's start reviewing the, each one of these steps and giving more weight to each one of these characteristics. So step one, natural variability. So you have some corn here, you see the different types. This doesn't look like anything like the corn that we eat because what we eat is a monoculture of just one type. But in nature, in the wild, you can have a great variety of corn. Here is a, just a quick picture of different types of peppers. So there is variability, not only in the size, the shape, as you know very well, they also in how spicy though the peppers are. 
So the premise here is that variation naturally exists in the population. Remember that most traits have alleles that make it different. Now, this variation is what's going to be what we call the raw material for natural selection. So you have a variety of things and natural selection, basically your environment, are go is going to be the one that basically decides which one can make it and which one cannot. Right? Basically, not all individuals are equally well adapted to the environment. You know, if we are thinking of things that we are familiar with, some cows produce more milk, some animals are faster, some plants produce sweeter fruits, some plants produce more seeds than others, some are taller, some are shorter, some can tolerate harsh winters, others cannot, even within the same species. So the idea is that the environment allows only the fittest, that's a good word, fittest. Basically that's the one that has what it takes to survive under those conditions and most important is not only surviving, the important part is that they need to reproduce, to pass on those genes to the next generation. You might be very fit and very good, but if you don't leave offspring, you are technically dead from the evolutionary point of view because your genes are not going to go into the next generation. So in order to be fit, of course you are the best for that environment, but also you need to be able to reproduce and pass those genes on. Now, where does this variability come from? So here we have to review a little bit of what we have done already. One source of variation, and this actually is the only source of new traits, mutations. This is actually the only source of brand new traits, the only one. Repeat, mutations is the only source of new traits, and those, you know, are changes in the DNA sequence of organisms. So you have a C here, that here was a T, that's a mutation. The other source of variation, but it's not creating new traits, it's just shuffling, mixing things, occurs during meiosis. One step is during crossing over, when homologous chromosomes exchange pieces, right there, this, the blue and the red, you exchange piece. That's exchange of homologous segments during crossing over. And then remember that if you look at a situation with two traits, you, remember individuals have many, many, many traits. And I have an individual that is, let's say, heterozygous for two different traits. Remember that the chromosomes assort independently. So when you make your gametes, remember your gametes, what you are going to do is you are going to put one of each chromosome. So even though this individual had this, he can make, or she, he, because it's a sperm here, can make a variety of combinations. Big A can go with little B, little A can go with little big B, and so forth. So this individual will be able to make at least four different gametes, four new different combinations. So gene shuffling because of the independent assortment of the chromosomes, remember each homologous pair is independent of the other, and crossing over. And then you have the third factor that happens here, when you have two gametes, a sperm and an egg, remember that individuals produce millions of sperms and eggs it depends of the species but can be also a great diversity of eggs. Which sperm fertilizes which egg? That's another source of variation. Which traits that are carried in the sperm are going to mix with which traits carry in the egg. So this all contributes to creating new combinations. Repeat, mutations is the only source of new traits, but the gene shuffling 
and the sexual reproduction of random matings is going to produce new combinations of genes which produces new individuals, new types of phenotypes. Now, a new concept for you, since we are looking now at genotypes and genes, is the concept of the gene pool. A gene pool is all the genes that you have in a population. Now, what is a population? It's a group of individuals of the same species, that's important, same species, same species, same species that can mate with each other, okay? So the gene pool is all the individuals of the same species that have the possibility of mating with each other and exchanging genes. So here you have a bunch of pigs, each pig has a different genotype for this trait, you can see it here. So the genotype are always two letters representing the two homologous chromosomes, but the gene pool refers to the individual alleles that they all have when you look at them all together in the population. How many of big bees are there in the population? How many little bees are there? So that is the gene pool, and we are going to work with this later on. So, what are we going to do in evolution? One of the things that happened, remember is change over time, sometimes is just the change of frequencies. At some point, maybe the dominant trait is more common. At a different point, the recessive trait is more common depending on the environmental conditions. So changing the abundance of the genes, the particular traits, is a way of evolution. Now, I need you to think of genetic variation, which you can apply to many different things in life. High genetic diversity, basically having a variety of different traits in the population is good, very good, because if the environment changes, there are at least some individuals that might have the right conditions to survive. So basically when you have high genetic variation, you have kind of insurance because at least some organisms will have the right combination of traits to tolerate the change and survive and pass on those genes to the next generation. What happens if you have low genetic variation? What happens if most individuals in the population are almost the same? Well, there is less to choose from. So if the environment changes, either they are all going to do great or they are all going to not do so well. So it's kind of a double or nothing situation. So this is not good because they are less tolerant to changes. There is less where to choose from. One of the things that kills a lot of organisms is diseases and variability is important to be able to defend against uh, viruses, bacteria, parasites, all sorts of things. Different genes, different susceptibility. Let's introduce inbreeding. Inbreeding. Inbreeding is when you mate with close relatives. Inbreeding, either close relatives or a very small group of individuals. Imagine that you live in a small town of 200 people and everybody just reproduces within that town. Nobody leaves that town or comes into that town. So basically, over many generations, everybody ends up being related. That is inbreeding, mating among, among a small group of organisms. Okay? When you mate within a very small group, basically you are just rehashing the same genes and there is nothing new and there is very little new to add to it. Even the new combinations, they, they tend to repeat because there is nothing new. So keep that in mind. Inbreeding, 
uh, creates low genetic diversity. So all that about variation, step one. Let's move on to step two very quickly. And this is the struggle for existence and this is all about competition because we know that resources are limited and that is food, territory, mates, water. Don't always think it's just food, but territory and mates are important factors. And who's gonna survive? Of course, the one that has the better traits at a particular time. So you love to do these ones. How do they survive? Then it has great defenses, those quills. This, how this one survives? That's an insect, stick insert, stick insect. So the birds don't really see it. This one, you know, survives because it sprays that stinky smell and marks their territory warning. Hey, don't come my way. And of course, the beautiful polar bear survives because of the layer of fat and the special fur that has that insulates it for the cold weather. So all those things are adaptations, characteristics that allow them to survive and make them better. So if you are better, you are the one that are gonna survive. You are the fittest. You are the best adapted to your environment. Now, adaptation, these traits that allow you to do well in the environment. Remember, an adaptation is just something that allows you to do better in the environment. But be careful because it depends on the environment. An adaptation might be good in environment A, but by, might be terrible in environment B. It's all you have to be careful and not make generalizations. Okay? So adaptations basically are always going to increase your chance of survival. But remember, it's not only survival, it's reproduction, the important thing. You have to pass on those traits. Otherwise, there is no point on it. Now, I want to go over the two types of adaptations that we have. Structural, meaning that belongs to your body and is genetically determined. And also behavioral adaptations. Actually, behavior is also genetically de determined. So your genes determine your behavior. Some of these are migration, uh, organisms that migrate summer and winter. Hibernation, a way to deal with uh, low temperatures and food scarcity. Basically, you just sleep all winter long. Schooling in fishes, when they stay together, that's a great... Um, adaptation to avoid predation and flocks in birds same thing uh, avoid pred predation but also increase the efficiency of flying in the air so let's look at a couple of adaptations remember that they are inherited so if you pass them on they have whatever it takes to survive in the environment and they increase your chance of survival uh, the fish here has a special mucus that uh, helps it uh, defend against the stinging uh, arms of the sea anemone. The anemones have stinging fingers here, but the fish has a special mucus that protects it, and that's why they live there. These, the adaptation are those flaps of tissue there that allows them to glide through the air as a way to travel faster and avoid predators. These are not flying, they just glide from high to low. Here you have the big ears. Uh, they are not necessarily for hearing better, but for cooling. These creatures live in the desert and they cool off using those big ears. And of course we have plants that avoid predation by having modified leaves that become spines. Yes, in cacti, the leaves become spines. Now, some more adaptations, and this falls into what we call camouflage, adaptations that allow organisms to blend with the environment. Camouflage, you're all familiar with that. So, these are insects that look like thorns, obviously. This is a great way to avoid predation. Same thing here, you have a flounder, this is a fish, and it mimics the composition of the bottom 
can change color so again it's a way to avoid predation but also to sneak upon their prey aha very sneaky so these are structural adaptations and some more camouflage that you can enjoy frogs that look just like sticks this is a seahorse that looks like seaweed a snake is the same color of the reddish soil hard to see i can attest to that and this is a nice fish that looks like the coral in where it's living so those are all adaptations that either help them avoid predation or they make them better predators because the prey cannot see them now there is another type of adaptation that i want you to be familiar with it's called mimicry and this is when you start looking like another organism and by looking like another organism you gain protection or advantages all right now you have to remember this is not on purpose it's not like oh i'm gonna look like another one oh i'm gonna camouflage i'm gonna pretend to be a rock no is that those organisms that tend to look like that are selected so through many 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 generations natural selection is kind of selecting and getting better at it so you look even more similar or your camouflage becomes even better because only those that can fake it are the ones that survive remember it's not on purpose it's just that they just happen to have the right things so let's look at mimicry quickly i have a hoverfly and a wasp this is the fly this is the wasp if you are a bird you do not want to eat a wasp however there are these flies that their color pattern in their body is very similar when you are a bird flying you are not gonna stop and look very carefully oh are you a fly or a wasp no you look similar to a wasp forget it i'm not eating it so this gains protection by mimicking this now remember this not that they do it on purpose but a mutation or something created a slight pattern that gave it some similar pattern of colors and natural selection keeps on selecting the ones that basically look the most like it those are the ones that survive so generation after generation the pattern improves and gets better it takes many 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 thousands of years to improve the pattern until it gets better today if you do a survey of mimicry in the animal kingdom you see different levels some that are almost perfect and some that you can tell are starting the process of mimicry and are starting to be selected for they're not very similar but you can tell it's coming one of the best examples of mimicry is between the monarch butterflies and the viceroy monarchs are toxic to birds birds do not eat them a young bird might try to eat one and immediately basically vomits the butterfly because it's very toxic and distasteful so what happens look at this other one if you look very carefully they are very different the patterns of dots and stuff are very different but if you are a bird you're not gonna take your chance so even though these ones are very good to eat birds should be eating them they are not being eaten because they mimic that one so it's just again these are all adaptations that give them an edge and allow them to survive finally because of these changes that not everybody survives because not everybody survives because only some of them get selected and get to pass their traits on basically we are gonna have after generation after generation you are gonna see that the organisms are changing slowly but they are changing all right and if they are changing you can always tell where they came from and that introduces the idea that we have common ancestors 
and organisms are going to change over time due to environmental pressure and natural selection is going to select them. So change is happening and that is how organisms change. So you don't need to write much here but just visualize this. This right here is the common ancestor of all the finches that live in Galapagos. This is the variety of finches that live in Galapagos. This is the original bird that flew in from the mainland, from Ecuador, the country of Ecuador, flew in, established a population, started mating, increasing numbers. But depending on the area and the island, different traits in this original population of birds were selected and this original one that of course had to have some variability was selected for different things in different places so as you look carefully different traits were selected for in the different islands and in the different environments and over time they become different species they become so different that they don't recognize each other anymore. We have the same situation in Hawaii with these beautiful birds called honey creepers. Hawaii is a volcanic island just like the Galapagos, so the island just pops in the middle of the ocean, so birds colonize it from the mainland. So you have the original species, one species, and then depending on the island, and the particular environments of each one of the Hawaiian islands, specific traits were selected for and they started diverging. And now you are to the point that each one of these is so different from the other ones that they do not mate with each other. So, what does natural selection do to phenotypes? Well, it's gonna change their phenotypes and you are gonna see three patterns you are gonna see and this is all visual directional disruptive or stabilizing selection i'll give you some graphs and then we'll talk some more about this in class directional selection here we are going to use the example of big size so you have some birds with big beaks some birds with small beaks and most of the birds have a average size of beak. So here is number of birds in a population and here is the beak size. When food becomes scarce, and this is data from the Galapagos Islands, uh, basically the only seeds, seeds start getting bigger and there are fewer and what's going to happen is going to be a shift. It's going to be a shift. Notice the dotted line is the original size of the beaks, like here. And then you have the solid line here that represents the beak size. And basically the beak size shifted. And when food scarce, the size of the beaks get bigger. So that's directional because the trait, in this case big size, goes in one direction, increases in size. We'll talk about a few more examples in class. Another example is, or not example, another case is what we call stabilizing selection. Again, most traits have this normal distribution. So here's percentage of the population. And the one that I'm showing you here is birth weight. So if you are too big, you are going to die because your head is too big and get stuck in the birth canal. And I'll show you how that happened when we are in class. If you are too small, basically you are not developed enough and at birth you are probably likely to die. So you are not going to get this way because you don't fit. It's not going to go that way because you are not developed enough. So what happens over time with the birth weight is kind of on a very narrow range that is optimum and neither extreme is good. So the curve doesn't extend. That 
stabilizing selection where the extremes are eliminated. And I'll show you a good example with humans and discuss this in class. Finally, the other pattern of selection that we see with natural selection is you have this kind of distribution you know, a few small, a few big, and most individuals are of average size, and the population sometimes is going to split. And what you end up having is the really small ones are good, and the really big ones are good. But everything in between is not selected for. A good example of this is the color of mice, actually, in Arizona. There are some, in the desert, there are mice that are dark, light in color, and then there are the in-between that are kind of grayish. In areas where you have lava, what color is lava? Lava is very dark. The desert is very light in color. So if you have an area with a lava flow, so this is lava, and here is the desert sun, guess what happened to the color of these organisms, of these mice? In the lava, the dark mice are going to survive. In the desert area without the lava, the light color mice are going to survive because they camouflage against their predators, the hawks that are eating them. But if you are gray in color, you don't fit either one. You stand out in either one and you are eliminated. So this is an example of disruptive selection. So we see all these patterns in nature and you just need to be able to recognize it and figure out if it's directional stabilizing or disruptive and we'll talk some more about this in class. Finally, we need to make the distinction between natural selection, natural, your environment determines what happens to you, versus artificial selection where we humans decide what happens to you. And the best example of artificial selection is what we have done with domesticated animals and all the crops, all the foods that we eat. Everything that we eat is the product of 10,000 years of artificial selection by farmers. Why 10,000 years? Because that's when agricultural, agriculture started in the Mesopotamia area. All right? So 10,000 years and all the foods that we eat today look absolutely nothing like the originals. And I'll leave you with your favorite creatures, of course. Dogs, you know, dogs are the closest relatives of the wolf that were domesticated and bred and crossed and selected for different traits. And that's how we end up with almost more than 100 varieties or breeds of dogs, all because of artificial selection. I hope this helped. I hope you understand a little bit more about natural selection. I hope the back of your brain is going to start processing this and paying attention to the outside, especially now in the spring, when a lot of creatures come out and do their thing. So thank you for listening. I'll see you in class.